So we are going to show that every finite group is isomorphic to some quotient of a free group. To do that, let's first go over what a free group is. Usually when we look at groups, we want to think about the relations between elements. For example, we might say in the dihedral group that r times s is equal to s times r inverse. Or if we're looking at the symmetric group, we might say that 1, 2 times 2, 3 equals 1, 2, 3. But we can also consider another type of group, which is a group where there are no relations between elements at all. In other words, we don't have any of these kinds of equalities between elements. Every element is distinct, and also every product is distinct. The only difference is, when we look at a group, we also have to satisfy the group axioms. So in the case of a free group, we always need to have, for example, g times g inverse equals the identity. That never changes because we need it to be a group. But if we're looking at the free group on a set of elements, so suppose that we have a set having the elements s1, s2, and so on to sn. If we have s1 times s2, this is never going to be equal to s2 times s1 by definition. In fact, there is no product that's ever going to be equal to any other product except in a case where it has to in order to be a group. For example, s1 times s2 s2 inverse is equal to s1 because in a group we need to have that the inverse times the original element gives us the identity. Besides that though, there are no relations at all. Now let's suppose that we have some finite group G. And what we're going to do is number all of the elements in G. Since there's a finite number, we can just number them. So we have G1, G2, G3, and so on, all the way to Gn. So one of these elements will be the identity, and the rest of them will be various other elements in the group. So together, this gives us every possible element in the group. What we want to do is once we have this set G, we want to construct a set S that has the same number of elements as G. So if G has n elements, we also want S to have n elements. And then we're going to associate each element of S with one element of G. And in this case, when we number the elements from 1 to n, all we're going to do is associate S1 with G1, S2 with G2, S3 with G3, and so on. So every element of the group has a corresponding element in the set S. What we're going to do now is consider the free group on the set S. So this is a free group with n elements, and we want to show that G is isomorphic to a quotient of the free group on S. To do that, we're going to define a homomorphism that goes from the free group to the original group G. And it's going to look like this. So we have a map phi goes from the free group on S to the group G. And if we're looking at an element of the free group on the set S, every single element is going to be a product of elements in this set. So we have S sub A1 times S sub A2 times S sub A3 and so on. So this is just an arbitrary number of elements that we're multiplying together, say to S sub AK. And in the free group, we might also have some of them being inverses. So we could put a plus or minus one in the exponent of each of these. This is an arbitrary element of the free group. Phi is going to take that element and it's going to map it to the element in G described by G sub A1, G sub A2, and so on to G sub A K with the same plus or minus from the original set. Now, when we look at the free group, we can't really evaluate these kinds of products. Besides an element in its inverse, there are no relations between the elements. So this is just going to be one long string of elements in the set. But when we look at the element in the group, this is a product of elements in the group, so we can actually evaluate this, and this will just become some specific element g sub r that's in the group. We can only evaluate it, though, once we go from the free group to the actual group we're interested in. From here, we want to show that phi is a homomorphism. So let's consider what is phi of a product of two different elements. So say we have s sub a1 all the way to s sub a k. That's our first element. And then we multiply that by s sub b1 all the way to s sub b k. 
and then possibly with some pluses or minuses, but I'll exclude those for now. Well, when we have a product of two different elements, all we have to do is put these products together, so now we have one really long product. And if we do phi evaluated on this product, we're going to get, like we see here, g sub a1 all the way to g sub ak times g sub b1 all the way to g sub bk. And if we think about what would happen if we did this exact same thing, except we split it up into two different evaluations of phi. So we have phi of the first element times phi of the second element. This first phi is going to give us g sub a1 all the way to g sub ak. And the second phi is going to give us this second product. And we just multiply those together. So really, if we split it up into two different evaluations here, we're going to get the same product at the end. And that's the definition of a homomorphism that phi of x times y is equal to phi of x times phi of y. So we have that this phi is a homomorphism. The next thing that we want to do is check whether phi is surjective. And that means for any element in the group, is there some element in the free group that maps to it? Well, we know that g is finite and we numbered all of the elements up here. So every single element in the group can be written as g sub r for some number r between 1 and n. So can we find an element in the free group that maps to g sub r? We can, because we can just look at s sub r. By definition, we said that phi of s sub i was just going to map to g sub i. And so phi of s sub r equals g sub r. And that means that our map is surjective, because we can always do this for any r. And therefore, we get every single element of the group with this method. So now we know that phi is a surjective homomorphism. What we're going to do now is apply the first isomorphism theorem. Now, the first isomorphism theorem says that for a homomorphism phi, the image of phi is isomorphic to the first group, free group on S, mod the kernel of phi. So first of all, let's think about what the image of phi is. Well, we know that phi is surjective. What that means is every output can be written as phi of some input. And the image of phi, by definition, is all the elements of the form phi of some f, where f is in the free group. If we're able to write every element in the group as phi of f, like we saw earlier, because phi is surjective, the image is just the entire group G. And so we get immediately that the group G is isomorphic to the free group on S mod the kernel of phi. And therefore, every finite group is isomorphic to this quotient of the free group. So that's how we know that every finite group is isomorphic to a quotient of the free group. We can number the elements in that finite group and then associate it with a set with the same number of elements, where every element in the set corresponds to one element in the group. Then we just take any product in that free group on the set and map it to the product in the group. That's a homomorphism, and it also goes to every element. So we get that g is isomorphic to that free group mod the kernel of phi. Now, sometimes when people present this proof, instead of making a new set that corresponds with the group g, we can just look at the free group on the elements of G. So rather than making a new set, we say that our set of generators is just the elements in the group. And then when we do this homomorphism, it takes this string that we were just leaving as, for example, G1, G2, G3, and then we actually take the product in the group, and it gives us one specific element in the group. In that case, if we look at the kernel of phi, it gives us all of the possible products of elements in the group that evaluate to the identity when we multiply them together. And that set, all the set of products that multiply to the identity, those are often called the relations on the group G. So if we think about any specific finite group, we can write it as a free group quotiented with the set of relations, the set of elements that map to the identity. And that really gives us a description of how the group works. It's an arbitrary set of products, but sometimes when we multiply those products, it just becomes the identity element. And that's what describes our group. So that's why every group 
is isomorphic to some quotient of a free group.